Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser, NHL player. That's the National Hockey League. Jack Johnson has declared bankruptcy after his parents squandered $15 million of his money on houses and DYI. Yes, we're all Jack Johnson now because like Jack, you may work hard every day, earn a great or even not so great salary, but, uh, and you're not living beyond your means. But just like Jack Johnson, you are now bankrupt. We all are because our wealth too has been squandered by our central bankers and central governments also acting on our behalf. And just as with Jack, most of the squandering also went on property speculation, financial speculation, misallocation of capital into such things as home improvements, shale gas exploration, and share buybacks. All that hard work for nothing. Well, it's quite appropriate that you're speaking about DIY, not DYI, but uh, do it yourself and fix it up because, of course, the mayor's office here, they're uh, doing some home improvements, office improvements. I hear them banging next door. <laughs> That's the mayor's little office. It's, a, it's actual demonstrating to you, the audience, the, the misallocation of capital going on around the world. Are you sure that's not Russell Brand building his <laughs> own office? Well, okay, so you spoke about Jack Johnson. And uh, first of all, he's an ice hockey player. Jack Johnson has blamed his parents for leading him financially astray after he filed for bankruptcy, despite amassing $18 million during his nine-year NHL career. Now, he had given his mother uh, a, a power of attorney thinking that she would be better and she would take care of him and she would care about him and not uh, squander it. Sure enough, she squandered it and all his hard work, he thought he was earning money, working hard. I know you know how hard it is to be an ice hockey player, getting out there at four in the morning, doing all your practices and stuff like that with the Zamboni. Oh yeah, no, yeah, of course. Ice hockey is a hard sport. And he made a lot of money, and his parents squandered it because he gave them essentially power of attorney. People in the United States or Britain have given their state the power of attorney to squander their future because the state spends for every dollar of GDP that's made here in Britain, the state spends five or six pounds uh, on a white elephant, on stuff like fracking, which is basically a hoax. Uh, they spend it on uh, financialization of the city of London to create uh, ever greater uh, pyramids of debt and, and Ponzi scheme economics. And so they've given the state the power of attorney to squander their wealth. And as a result, uh, they, like Jack Johnson, the poor hockey player, will find, wake up one day uh, in, in penury. <laughs> well, he had to break free of his parents, and uh, he will continue to earn money. Now he's earning $5 million this year, and he's going to be fine. But how can we break free from the state? However, there is, uh, you know, he, he was led astray, he said, so I'm going to turn to how we're led astray and all the signs that we're being led astray and that we're becoming bankrupt. Right now we think we're, we're doing better because the stock markets and house prices continue to rise. But here's a tweet from Mohammed El Arian, and he says, FYI, Neil Irwin, on giant contradiction at the heart of U.S. economy. This is the central paradox. You see this chart, the S&P 500, up, 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 up. Oil prices plunge, 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 plunge. And he said one of these stories is lying. Remember, you and I here on Kai's Report months ago pointed this out when, the, when it really first started to diverge, that oil was acting as if the, the real economy is collapsing and stock markets were acting as if it was all okay. Well, I don't know if people remember, it wasn't too long ago, the Beanie Baby craze. Beanie Babies, you know, they were this little uh, stuffed animals, essentially. <laughs> that but, was like 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago. But as part of it, it came around at the same time, I think eBay was also kind of launched into the world. And so Beanie Babies, along with Pez dispensers, uh, became collector's items. And the prices went up incredibly high, and it became a, a mania until the Beanie Baby craze collapsed. And then now nobody even remembers what a Beanie Baby is. Same thing with dollars and, and well, stock market, particularly the United States. The stocks are trading at Beanie Baby-like valuations. People buy them because they're, they, they're part of a mania. It's cool. It's interesting. They like to talk to their friends about it. There's no fundamental economic reason why you would buy the Dow Jones or S&P 500 at these levels. Well, it's because you've given the power of attorney, the power of control of your wealth over to the central bankers, and you believe the central bankers are taking care of you and that you never fight the Fed, and the Fed will take care of you. And this is what people have trained, and this is what we're going to go into. But in the real economy, you know, you have the likes of China slashing interest rates and reminding their citizens that it's against a lot of jump from tall buildings. Whereas, of course, in the West, that's the difference between us. We encourage bankers to uh, 
Look, this well, is called no, Without a <laughs> shadow of a doubt, the most irresponsible country and bank in the world is Japan, and people are openly referring to their latest bout of quantitative easing as a Pearl Harbor. <laughs> in the glowing uh, currency wars around the world, that they are willing to blow themselves up. They're the original suicide bombers, you know, the kamikaze pilots. You know, they, they were long uh, before the frickin', you know, vest strapped on wearing suicide bombers in the Middle East. You had the kamikaze pilots of Japan. That's their mentality. Now they've applied that to central banking. They're trying to blow up the world yeah. by I issuing quantitative easing round number 12 to kill the their own currency. To, you know, essentially, it's the animosity with China, you know, they're trying to export their way back into some kind of reasonable position, but they're willing to blow themselves up, and they're, they're doing it. Well, that's the contradiction, is the real economy is collapsing, markets continue to go higher, and um, th th that's a sign that you're being led astray. If you continue to believe these central bankers have your best interests at heart, uh, you might end up bankrupt. Well, I have a new and theory. What's that? It's called a caldera. <laughs> if you know what a caldera is around a volcano, yeah. it's that ridge that forms around that sinkhole mm. that is a dead volcano. Japan is that dead sinkhole plummeting down to the center of the earth with quantitative easing to infinity that's debasing their currency and ruining the country. The other countries around the world who borrow in yen at an artificially low rate of zero percent or less are looking at stock markets that are forming a caldera around Japan. So the, the ridges are high, but this total structure is completely unstable and is set to frickin' blow. And when that happens, then we're going to go back to where we were four or five years ago. People panic buying gold. Well, David Stockman, who was in Ronald Reagan's White House and the Office of Management and Budget, of Management of the Budget, whatever, his headline regarding all of these, uh, the crazier and crazier and more crazy uh, central bank action, despite the alleged good times they keep on saying, sell, 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 the central bank madmen are raging, the global financial system has come unglued. Everywhere, the real-world evidence points to a cooling growth, faltering investment, slowing trade, vast excess industrial capacity, peak private debt, public fiscal exhaustion, currency wars, intensified political-military conflict, and an unprecedented disconnect between debt-saturated real economies and irrationally exuberant financial markets. And he particularly talks about the algorithms driving all trading, is that they take every single headline and buy, 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 buy. Everything's designed to buy, because, of course, you never fight the Fed, so every, every headline is taken as a buy. But he said, one day, what happens when they're told to sell, 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 sell? Well, you've talked about this, the insidious relationship between the computers and the fundamental reality of the market. And I refer back to the 1987 stock market crash, the biggest in history, where you had contention between the cash market in New York and the futures market in Chicago. And these two got into a lockstep, manic, uh, self-feeding selling frenzy that plummeted the stock market. Now we have the exact same thing going on, except this time it's basically um, algorithms that are programmed to buy stocks are referring to news articles that are also written by computers and bots. Mm. So the bots are writing articles in publications like Forbes. Forbes has digital assisted editorial computer bots that write the editorial content at Forbes. It's written by computers. The computers then read what the bots wrote, and then they buy stocks based on what the bots say. Then the bots look at the prices that the, uh, are on the stock market based on the new buying pressure that was caused by the bots to begin with, and they write a new story saying, well, prices are going up, and then they make up stories why to justify the higher prices, and you end up in a self-feeding, vicious uh, spiral, panic buying on the upside driven entirely by bots. Remember, almost 90% of the volume on the New York Stock Exchange is are computers. They're not humans. The humans are being essentially pushed aside. Well, there is a human in this equation who was trading on the fundamentals and on his conviction that this couldn't last, and that was Hugh Hendry. And I want to relate him to Jack Johnson, who's a, a victim of abuse, basically, by uh, authorities. So here we have Hugh Hendry interviewed by Marin Somerset Webb in Money Week, and it says, Hugh Hendry, would you rather upset God or have him just ignore you? So he goes over all these times that he sold because the market sold him to sold and you're supposed to sell your position and not, you know, if it goes down too much and you sell out. But he was always the wrong decision. So he tells Marin Somerset Webb, 
Over the summer, the European stock markets were down over 20%. And what happened? The ECB responded and, and took its rates negative, and it committed to re-engaging, reutilizing its balance sheet to acquire European risk assets. Prices rapidly rallied from the middle of August into September. Why did I sell? Why did I sell? He keeps on saying, why did I? And he now says he'll never sell again. And in fact, Marin Somerset Webb concludes the interview with saying, so the simple message here is in a market like this, never sell anything and you'll be fine. And he says, uh, you can say that, but I can't say it. Yeah, there's a name for that, uh, Berkshire <laughs> Hathaway. <laughs> you know, the, the greatest success story in the last 50 years. 40 years is uh, Warren Buffett. Yeah, that's a long term investor, but he's saying that. Well, Hugh Hendry never... is a freaking drama queen. Okay, <laughs> let me explain something. Hugh Hendry is letting his emotions get in the way of his performance, and he's competing against empathy vacant bots. <laughs> so he's never going to win that game. Now, he may think that he's a cold, calculating hedge fund manager who doesn't let emotions get in his way. But clearly, by those comments, he's a freaking drama queen crying over there at his desk. Boo-hoo, Hugh Hendry. But that is anyone who puts money with Hugh Hendry is a nut. It's beyond that. I'm, uh, it's beyond the simple, you know, let's remove that man from the equation and just say any hedge fund manager, any anybody in the market. Every hedge fund manager has underperformed the market exactly. for the last 25 years. Exactly. There's never been a hedge fund that's outperformed the market for any appreciable length of time. Full stop. That's the fact. If you put your money in the hedge fund, it's a guaranteed loser if you're in there for more than five or six years. Okay, but what I want to say is in terms of the whole overall show and leading it back to that we're being led astray, a headline regarding this interview says, Hugh Hendry on central bank terror. And what do terrorists want but to inflict psychological pain on the population and get them to do what they want for political reasons? Here, it's similarly for political, economic, and uh, essentially geopolitical reasons that they're training you. They're they're creating terror in the markets in order in the opposite way you've sold you've disobeyed us you've 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 contradicted the laws of our we you know, as you said god don't don't let god ignore you well it's behavioral economics so yes 20 years ago when computer trade had started on wall street it was a simply a matter of buying and selling based on arbitrage between let's say cash market and the, um, the, the, the physical market. But now, because of the surveillance technology that's being leased out by GCHQ, NSA, uh, computers are targeting someone like a Hugh Henry. They get into his head. Yeah, and they, they program they, themselves yeah. in ways to drive him insane because they yeah. want him to puke. They're it's, leading everybody astray. They're leading investors astray. Because They're it's terrorism, I buy, agree. Buy, buy, buy. That's the only thing you do. Never sell. Buy, buy, buy. And yet the real economy, every single s sign, our incomes, our wages, oil, commodities, everything is crashing because that's the real economy. Yeah, there's but a lot of good buys out there. <laughs> goodbye house. <laughs> goodbye car. Goodbye wealth. Goodbye, Stacy. <laughs> See you. Stay tuned for the second half. A whole lot more. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to Chicago. Speak with Eric Hunsader. He's the founder of Nanex. Eric, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Thanks for having me on, Max. All right, Eric, tell us about Nanex. You know, we see your charts all the time in the media. They're brilliant. They're beautiful. What exactly are you doing over there? Uh, we process market data, and there's a lot of it. It's very difficult to explain um, lots of numbers, and so the charts are all about explaining that for the average person. So uh, this is a very important issue because data itself has become the market in a lot of ways, and high-frequency traders and algorithmic traders that are uh, programmed by uh, uh, really uh, uh, computer programmers are influencing market more than, let's say, fundamental analysis or what the uh, companies are actually doing. So on the question of high-frequency traders, which is this ability to place millions and billions of orders quickly, are they adding liquidity as they claim, or do they manipulate markets as the, maybe as I would claim? What are your thoughts? Yeah, the, the, it's dubious they add meaningful liquidity. I mean, a lot of their strategies are about detecting large orders and getting out of the way, which I think is the opposite of liquidity. Right. So we know that, for example, when there was a genuine crisis, uh, or there have been uh, moments of um, where liquidity is needed, these guys simply step away. So they're actually not adding liquidity. They're just scalping, uh, really, markets. 
uh, using technology, isn't it, uh, and there's no different really, if I put a high frequency trading and I co-locate the server next to the New York Stock Exchange, isn't that the same thing as sticking a, a tube in my neighbor's gasoline tank and siphoning off gas? <laughs> hmm, I don't, I'm not sure about that ana analogy. Well, in other words, uh, they are putting the servers next to the exchange to gain, to game the system or to gain an advantage time-wise by putting orders in ahead of larger orders and they're scalping. So that, they're not adding anything. I mean, how is that different than just stealing? They're not adding anything. And you know, there's, I don't have a problem that they're not adding anything. It's just when they claim that they are adding something, that, then I have a problem with that. Well, in, in 2009, Eric, we interviewed Tyler Durden of Zero Hedge. At the time, he reckoned that $100 million per day was being scalped in this matter uh, using high-frequency trading. Has that number grown, or is that about the same? Uh, it's probably about the same. We, we just did a uh, real-world study from a trader who was trying to buy and sell tens of thousands of shares of Ford, and he... Well, we found in the data he was experiencing the exact same thing that uh, was described in the book Flash Boys. So uh, this is alive and well. Right. So Michael Lewis, who is uh, writing about all kinds of, you know, went, going all the way back to uh, Liar's Poker, he's been a chronicler of fraud in these markets, both in the U.S. and around the world in places like Iceland and Ireland. And Flash Boys depicts... Uh, these traders who are essentially, once again, to underline this point, they are stealing money. Eric, your thoughts? Uh, you know, I think it's, um, they're trying to play by the rules, but there's a lot of obfuscation going on where they're trying to claim that they're, uh, they're being uh, good for the market and on balance, I think they're negative for the market. Yeah, look, Eric, I worked on Wall Street for many years. The, the rules are set by regulators that are controlled by the brokers. So it's not like an independent regulatory body are, are setting rules in the interest of the public. They're, it's a captured regulator. All the regulators in the U.S. are captured, and they're gaming the system, and they're stealing money. Full stop. I, I agree with you. There is, there is no regulator. Uh, okay, okay, the, okay. Let, let, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, another common theme that we hear that you are, are talking about all the time, and you have an excellent Twitter stream or you're really keeping people up to date on a real-time basis about this. How often are stock market quotes canceled before we even see them, so-called spoofing? Right. So, I mean, just simple physics will tell you that 25% uh, of all quotes are getting canceled before people in California are able to see them. That number is 35% by the time they get over uh, across the pond, if you will. Uh, and, you know, placing an order knowingly knowing that you are going to cancel it before people can physically access it that's something so easy to detect and measure and prove and yet the regulator hasn't done so right and once again the purpose of this spoofing or placing orders and then immediately canceling them is to more or less trick the market into coming out with orders that would respond to what they appear to be some kind of price trend but are not actually there concurrently one has to imagine that bets are being made in parallel markets, could be the option market, that are going to benefit by these price movements. So it's a cheap way, again, to make a profit by engaging in spoofing or false price quotes or quote stuffing, as it's also called, to game the system. And they're not adding anything, correct? Correct. That is your spot on. Okay, so <laughs> in other words, if you're not adding anything, and you own the regulators, and you end up at the end of the day hundreds of millions of dollars richer uh, by, by gaming the system. How, how is that not also tantamount to fraud? Uh, there's, uh, I wouldn't say it's a fine line. I, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess we have to, it brings us back to the, the regulators. I know that on the regulatory arguments uh, that are made from their point of view, is that they, they like to think that these uh, functions that are being uh, applied are somehow, the, the phrase adding liquidity come, comes to mind. For example, when Lloyd Blankfein is interviewed by Charlie Rose, and Charlie Rose asks him about these things, he'll say, well, we're adding liquidity and we're making a market. Uh, but we've just demonstrated that in both cases, adding liquidity or making a market do not apply in this case, and it brings you right back to, the, to this idea that this is just market manipulation 
and and pilfering. Is that is that a fair statement? You know, when I hear that, when I've I've heard this over the years, as you have, and um, I always wonder if these are smart people and they're not just going to sit there and lie all the time. And what I found out was I actually had a very pointed discussion with several of them on my Twitter feed. And it turns out their definition of liquidity is very different than yours and mine. Their definition of liquidity is, well, if a high-frequency trader uh, buys or sells, they are by definition adding liquidity. Right, okay. They believe, mm -hmm. that. They believe that. Well, let, let's just take a step back for a second and talk about how markets work. You have the classic specialist market-making function. They're operating both as a broker and as a dealer. As a broker, they're matching trades. As a dealer, they have an inventory of that particular stock that they make a market in. In the case of a buyer shows up and there are no sellers, and maybe a seller show up and there are no buyers, but this is what the broker-dealer does to keep markets liquid so that people can put in a market order and get it executed in real time. And this is the really the grease that keeps capitalism, free market capitalism or stock market, free market capitalism rolling. But to suggest that by preempting large orders based on insider information is not different than inside information. Now, in the case of the New York Stock Exchange floor specialist system, they are, to maintain their inventory, positioning trades ahead of what they see as large market moving trades, but they are, there are laws against that. There are front running laws against it. It's clearly, in, 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 in legal terms, it's against the law to front run your customers. So how can the high frequency traders say that that law doesn't apply to them, Eric? Well, it's because, well, in the United States, it's because we have a fragmented market. There's not just the New York Stock Exchange. There's 10 other exchanges. And what, what goes on is the liquidity, in other words, buy and sell or ready, sell, buy and sell orders that are ready to be on the other side of somebody who wants to place a market order are now not concentrated at one exchange or at 10 different exchanges. So once they execute at one of those 10, the high frequency traders have faster equipment that they can actually go to the other markets and either cancel existing orders or wor worse, uh, buy in the same direction as what they know will be uh, soon, that large order will soon hit by using slower connections. Okay, so what so, we're describing is that these high frequency traders, they know the law and they've figured out a way to skirt the law. L let's move on to another piece of the puzzle here, uh, which basically would be wash trading. So these are traders that are buying a security and also selling the same security. Uh, and, and, and basically engaging in wash trades. How big of a how big of a problem is is this uh, in the markets today, Eric? I think it's it's a very large problem. I, I think it happens all the time. So describe I mean, we, describe to see, me. You're on the front line there. Describe a wash trade to the viewers. It's when they're on both sides of the of the trade, and so it looks it looks like there's activity in the stock when there actually isn't. And they're just buying and selling from themselves. Right, so let's say uh, you are in the market and you want the price of a stock or something uh, in the market to go up 2% or down 2% based on the fact that you've got trades on in parallel that would profit from that move. You can then program the computer to engage in wash trades, which effectively cost you nothing, buying and selling, to move the price to the point where you've made a profit, correct? Correct, and they're also doing, so they're also setting this up on the equity side and and there'll be participants, actually part of the strategy is, is doing the opposite thing in the options market. And uh, the, even, you know, the best firms bring in futures at the same time, which by the way, our, regu our, our SEC regulator only looks at the equity markets and they don't look at futures and our CFTC only looks at futures and doesn't look at equity, so nobody's watching this. Okay, so for those out there who say that well, market manipulation doesn't exist because for every buyer there's a seller and for every seller there's a buyer. They're missing a fundamental point, that wash trading is endemic and this is a manipulation of the system where it, uh, traders are essentially both a buyer and seller. So that argument doesn't hold any water whatsoever, right, Eric? Uh, yes. I, I can tell you there is no regulator that's really watching. 
All right, so uh, we've seen so much of this kind of, whether it's wash trading, spoof trading, or high frequency trading, as we've just described them, all basically ways to skirt the law and to steal and to commit fraud. We're, we've seen it apply to the Forex market, which is a multi-trillion per day market, the LIBOR market, a multi-trillion uh, dollar market. Uh, so clearly this is impacting the entire global economy. Why are people or why are politicians not more motivated to do something about this usurpation of the entire global system with massive fraud? Because they're either part of it or, or, or it is so difficult to understand, they're easily bamboozled by the lobbyists. All right, Eric, we're out of time. Uh, thanks so much for your uh, excellent insight into this. We'll catch up with you again soon. Thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks for having me. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Eric Hunsader of Nanex. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.